Hi, everybody. I'm Sue Rosser, the Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at San Francisco State University. And it's my pleasure to welcome everyone this afternoon today to today's STEM Symposium. As you know, STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. And those represent uh, exciting opportunities for our country. But this particular event is one of the many exciting events planned this week in honor of the investiture of the 13th president of San Francisco State, uh, Dr. Leslie Wong and Mrs. Phyllis Wong, who is also here with us today. Could you please wave so everybody can see you? In addition to extending a welcome to the Wongs, I would also like to welcome the students, the faculty, the staff, and administrators from San Francisco State, our campus community, our alumni, also our Osher Lifelong Learning Institute representatives, guests from AT&T, the San Francisco Unified School District, and the San Francisco School Alliance. Your support of and interest in San Francisco State are greatly appreciated. We feel it on a daily basis. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Blakeman, the Regional Vice President of External Affairs for AT&T California. Mr. Blakeman manages AT&T's relationships with external clients and stakeholders, including elected officials and community and civic leaders in the San Francisco, Silicon Valley, and Central Coast regions. Mark is an active member of the community, serving on the board of directors of the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce as a member of the executive committee, and as a founding board member of San Francisco Citizens Initiative for Technology and Innovation. He is a founding board member of Genesis Works Bay Area and the chairman of the board of the San Francisco Asia Pacific American Heritage Foundation. Please join me in welcoming Mark Blakeman. Thank you so much, and I will be very brief. It's a pleasure to be here on this momentous occasion uh, with the investiture of Dr. Wong. at and was proud to be a, a supporter of this great week of events that are going on throughout the San Francisco community uh, to welcome Dr. Wong and his wife to, uh, to San Francisco. Um, also, I wanted to, uh, this particular symposium, symposium is of a great importance to at and because this is a, an issue that is very near and dear to our hearts. About four years ago, with our contract negotiations, we were um, bringing back about 4,000 jobs, that, uh, repatriating jobs that had been overseas, mostly in call centers. And we found that we were having difficulty uh, filling those positions uh, once we were bringing them back to the United States. And when we took a deeper dive into this, we began to realize that uh, although you don't necessarily need a college education to work in some of our jobs at AT&T, at &T, that uh, students just were not being prepared uh, well enough to come into the workforce. And I had just a few statistics that kind of highlighted that um, and, and where we're going. Um, I should also mention that um, in November, AT&T announced a $66 billion capital investment <laughs> program in our network across the country, um, which will mean uh, obviously a lot more jobs that we're hiring. In fact, just last week we announced 450 new jobs that we're hiring uh, here in California. These are engineers, designers, uh, network architects that help uh, build and design our network. And when you think about some of the statistics that I'm going to share with you, uh, that over the next six years, STEM jobs are projected to grow by 17% compared to just 10% for all other fields. And they expect to create 2.8 million new STEM jobs in the next uh, six years. And juxtapose that with this statistic, Nearly one-fourth of all students in our elementary and high school uh, uh, classrooms across this country won't graduate with their class. When they enter in, they, they will uh, either drop out or they will, it will take them longer than the normal amount of time. And when you think that STEM workers usually make on average 25 to 26 percent more than non-STEM workers, it, it really just goes to show you that we are missing out. And, and really, uh, from at and perspective, 
we have hundreds of jobs that go unfilled every year because we can't find qualified people. And so the great work that is happening here at, um, at SFSU uh, to encourage more and more uh, teachers to teach STEM, to enc uh, encourage more students and, and uh, uh, college students to take STEM classes will certainly make a huge difference in the years uh, ahead and certainly we can't have it uh, fast enough. So. I appreciate all the great work that you're doing here on campus. Uh, uh, Dr. Wong, um, we welcome you here and we look forward to having a great relationship, continuing our great relationship with SFSU. And I look forward to hearing some of the comments that are going to be made today. So thank you so much. Thanks very much, Mr. Blakeman. We certainly appreciate AT&T's support for this event and all the work you do in the community and for San Francisco State in particular. Uh, as Mark Blakeman was indicating, STEM is a national priority. Reports indicate that the U.S. is falling behind in STEM relative to other countries. For example, our research and development expenditures as a percentage of our uh, gross domestic product. Reports also show the declining U.S. participation in the national STEM workforce of U.S. Uh, born and educated students. Also, U.S. citizens' engagement with and training in science is relatively low. The United States, therefore, has needed to import talent from around the world in order to accomplish its scientific goals, as Mr. Blakeman was indicating. And as we hear pressure from uh, our colleagues, particularly in Silicon Valley, to uh, up the number of H-1B visas in order to meet our STEM workforce needs. Some of us feel that it's very important to educate the students who um, live in this country so that they can fill those needs. At San Francisco State, we receive a substantial portion of extramural sources of funding for active awards. In 2012, uh, we received about $35 million uh, dollars in STEM education. The vast majority of that came from the federal government, about 32.5 million. Uh, from the state of California, we received about 2.3 million, and then another slightly less than $100,000 from nonprofit organizations. Really, uh, STEM education uh, deficits affect our ability to find cures, improve the health of our citizenry, uh, to keep pace with technology since we're now in a global economy. So it's extremely important that we recruit, retain, and build a dominant STEM workforce. The U.S. has encouraged through federally enhanced funding to support STEM through all levels, kindergarten through doctoral training and beyond through postdocs and into the workforce. San Francisco State has put efforts into hiring faculty uh, whom you'll meet today committed to STEM to prepare our undergraduate students and also these faculty partner with the public schools and other institutions in the Bay Area to prepare students who will be bridging to our university. I would now like to introduce the first of our panels which is on STEM education. This is going to be led by Professor Eric Sue from the Mathematics Department in the College of Science and Engineering, who is also the director of the Center for Science and Mathematics Education. The panel members that will be joining him uh, to his right and your left is uh, Dr. Larry Horvath, assistant professor in the Secondary Education Department in the Graduate College of Education. He's also the principal investigator of the National Science Foundation San Francisco State Robert Noyce Teacher Scholarship Program. Uh, next to him is Mia Hiles, a student in the Single Subject Science Credential Program. The, that's someone who's going to be a teacher, yes, <laughs> in K through 12, who received her BS in biology with a concentration in zoology in 2012. Uh, then to her right is uh, Professor Carmen Domingo, who is uh, not only a professor, but also associate chair of the biology department in the College of Science and Engineering at San Francisco State. 
She's also the program director and principal investigator of the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, CIRM, uh, Bridges to Stem Cell Research. And she's program director, principal investigator of the NSF Research Experience for Undergraduates Program in Ecological, Evolutionary, and Developmental Biology. And we're hoping that another faculty member, Antwi Ackham, who's an associate professor of environmental sociology, public health, and STEM education from the Africana Studies Department in the College of Ethnic Studies, will make it. Um, he's also the co-founder and executive director of the Institute for Sustainable Economic, Educational, and Environmental Design. Eric, I'll let you take it away with the panel. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So um, <coughs> this panel is going to be a, an extremely fast, breathtakingly fast, uh, almost subliminal <laughs> overview of a number of interesting programs. But the subliminalists will make it more effective. <coughs> so uh, last year, there was a very interesting research report issued that was a, a survey of existing research trying to uh, study what are the keys for improving STEM achievement by underrepresented groups in California. And the keys that they identified turned out to be also great for everybody. And when we saw the report, we were really pleased because four out of the five areas of work are the areas of work that the center uh, is working on. And uh, so I'm going to give you an example uh, in each of these categories. And, uh, and I believe you'll find that most of the work that's being talked about today will also fall into these categories. So <clears throat> the first category is STEM teacher training. And uh, we have a portfolio of uh, programs for pre-service teachers and in-service teachers, science, mathematics, elementary, secondary. But I'm going to focus on the Teacher Fellows Program, which is uh, a professional community of future teachers, but it's also an organized way to coordinate service learning. So you have uh, about 70 plus uh, undergraduates and credential students participating in the program. We've served 158 since uh, the program was started in spring 2008. And they go out into the community and they do service. They've done thousands of hours of service in schools and districts around the Bay Area. And uh, we've gotten money from university funds and also from generous private donations. Uh, $382,000 we've given as stipends to encourage them. And they have made their own matching funds by applying for outside awards. And they've been awarded $285,000. I'm really proud of them for that. And it turns out, if you make a program like this and make a place for people, there are a lot of future teachers out there. So uh, when the program began, there were about 20-ish uh, math teacher majors. And right now, there are just about, there are over 80 of them. So we've, we've more than tripled the number. And I think it's no coincidence that the increase began uh, with the, the founding of the Teacher Fellows Program. So we think we're onto something there. I want to talk about the second key that was identified, which is K-12 STEM enrichment. <laughs> So you don't want to just wait until students get to college. You want to get people excited about science and mathematics uh, as early as possible. And so at the center, we have uh, a few different programs in science and math. I just wanted to talk about uh, the Sea Lion Bowl, which finished up um, in February. Basically, you have uh, 24 Northern California high schools sending teams to participate in an ocean science quiz bowl. So it's kind of Je <laughs> Jeopardy-style game. And it's a great diversity of schools. It's not just the... The, the elite schools. Uh, you have Oakland in there. You've got Lowell in there. So it's a really good diversity of schools. Uh, and it's more than just a one-time event. Yes, the winners get to go to Washington, D.C. to participate in a national game show. But it's more than just the one shot. It's the nucleus at each of these schools for science interest. And the leaders and volunteers of these programs form a year-long support community for the coaches and teachers at each school site. <coughs> So uh, the first three uh, programs listed there uh, serve about 500 students directly every year and uh, about 50 schools. The third area is forming bridges to college. And I wanted to briefly mention the Engineering Career Pathways program, which was begun last year. It's serving various underserved groups, uh, such as displaced workers and veterans or disadvantaged youth. And the idea is to mentor these students through community college and then get them to transfer ready to take engineering classes at a Cal State. <clears throat> and how do you do that? They come in usually at an algebra level, so they're going to need an intensive math year, uh, getting people from algebra to calculus ready. So this is a partnership we've uh, started with uh, five community colleges and three workforce investment boards. Uh, we've got about 125 students all together in there this year. 
And uh, preliminary results are very good. They're passing their classes at a much higher rate than a normal community college rate. The fourth, <coughs> the fourth key I wanted to talk about is higher education. So uh, the fourth key is to uh, uh, try to find ways to improve retention and recruitment at the higher ed level. And uh, I wanted to focus on the Climate Change Scholars Program, which is funded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, it's open to everyone, but we especially recruit women and underrepresented minorities. And these undergraduates work in research labs on issues connected to climate change science. So it's really great to get them doing research as early as possible. And they get special mentoring, and they even have a special seminar just for the cohort. So um, hopefully you've seen enough to get you curious to uh, learn more. <coughs> and uh, if you want to know more, there's a website there. And now I'm going to pass it to Larry and Mia. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Mia Hiles. And this is uh, my unexpected journey into teaching. It was totally unexpected. Um, I started my undergraduate at San Francisco State uh, in 2007, and I got my BS in biology and zoology. And um, just like a lot of students, on my senior year, I didn't really know what I was going to do after I graduated <laughs> until someone came in and made a presentation about Bio 652, which is a science education partners in biology class. And they take science undergraduates like me, and they put me in a K through 12 classroom to support the teachers in teaching science. And through that, I met Kimberly Tanner, who is the, <laughs> who is the program director of the Science Education Partnership and Assessment Laboratory, CEPL. And they worked with this Bio 60, 652 class. And right now, I still am getting advice and resources from this laboratory. And I'd like to give her a lot of thanks and credit to where I am today. I would not be standing here unless I had met Kimberly Tanner. And through her, I met Jamie Chan, as well as Eric Su, who are both um, program directors for the Center for Science and Math Education. And I became a teacher fellow through this center. And um, I'm allowed to collaborate with a lot of educators, as well as my professors, about ed science education and math education. And it was Jamie Chan and Kimberly Tanner, their concerted efforts, that got me to apply and stay at SFSU Single Subject Science Credential Program. Um, and through this science education program, I met Larry Horvath, uh, who is the principal investigator of the Robert Noyce Scholarship Program. And at this time, he would I would like to introduce Larry Horvath to talk more about the scholarship program. Thank you, Mia. So yes, I'm Larry Horvath, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the San Francisco State Robert Noyce Teacher Scholarship Program. Thanks, Mia, for that introduction. Um, what this program is, it's a five-year National Science Foundation grant. It's $1.2 million. Um, got this grant two years ago. The nice thing was is we were really ready for it because of all the things that Eric has done with the Center for Science and Math Education and the partners we do that we're able to fast track it. So we set our first cohort up. Usually you wait a year. We actually set them up in spring of 2011. Was that spring 2011? Yeah. In 2012, 13, we have our first full cohort coming through. What it is, it's um, 10 scholarships per year for highly qualified future middle and high school STEM teachers. And uh, there's the key there, committed to teaching in high need schools. When we think of qualified, we're really looking for teachers with this particular grant who are <laughs> committed to becoming teacher leaders and who have a natural bend to really have kind of an inquiring mind and really want to look at research to think about the teaching and learning of math and science in deep ways. Um, so we identify 10. We've, um, the nice thing again with Eric's program, our first fall we had 17 applicants. We can only give 10 scholarships per year. And then our following, sorry, our first spring we had um, 17 for 10. And our first fall, we had 24 applicants for 10 positions, so it's been really competitive. That's been kind of hard for me because we have a lot of qualified students who would be really committed to this kind of program. We support both undergraduate STEM majors and credential candidates, so we can support them for two years in this program as undergraduates. They have a unique program putting them into, they are fully engaged in the CSME Teacher Fellows Program, but we um, ramp up on top of that for all the Noyce Fellows for the undergraduates and the credentials, we have a noise seminar. Um, the noise seminar meets on Fridays from 4 to 6. And you know, Fridays at 4 to 6, they're so committed that um, they come in and they're an amazing group to work with. Fridays 4 to 6 is a tough time. They're happy. We just made last Friday. We work, we feed them, but that's when we do all that bit, so that's the setup. Um, strategic school placements for the undergraduates, they work in classrooms here in San Francisco Unified. 
that our research is occurring. For example, we have the Strategic Educational Research Partnership, SERP. Um, they're doing deep research into thinking about improving and, and the ways we work with literacy and science education and scientific argumentation. So the undergrads are working with teachers who are thinking as researchers already. Um, same with the, same with the um, master teachers that our credential candidates are placed with. Inquiry projects, they all do their own research project over the year. We're having a poster session on April 26th where they've done what we call action research in the classroom. Summer internships, they're working with city college students. They're mentoring city college students with a teacher pathways program into San Francisco State. Um, mentoring from CSME's teachers and residents, they actually work as mentors for the CSME fellows, working with teachers that we have identified who come work with us and do professional development and attend math and science education conferences. And last, we're looking at some of our research questions around our program. First one is initial program evaluation is focused on scholars developing conceptions of what it's like to be a teacher, leader, and action researcher. The second one is the big question. Um, longitudinal data collection is going to be focused on scholars' professional trajectories when they work in these high-need schools, classroom practices, how do they carry out these kind of things that are really meant for urban schools, and student learning outcomes. How do these things actually happen? So that's quick and fast. Thank you, Sarah. I can turn it over. Carmen? So it's a real pleasure and honor to be here today. Um, I'd like to talk about three different um, examples of projects happening in the biology department. Um, the first one is focused at um, providing undergraduates with hands-on research experience. And I think it's very clear that in order to prepare students for the workforce, they really need that um, individually uh, mentored um, research experience. And so this is just one example of programs that are funded um, by the National Science Foundation and the National Institute of Health to bring undergraduates working closely with faculty in the biology department. One program that's been really successful and it's in partnership with the romberg Tiburon uh, Research Center is, um, is a program that focuses on the, in, the interdisciplinary area of global climate, ecology, um, molecular and cell biology. And so here are some lovely images of undergraduates in the field working um, with, with faculty. Um, the program has grown in popularity that this year alone, just for this one program, we received 350 applications from universities across the country. And we're given the task to select 10, which is really unfortunate because there's going to be many, many students uh, that we could fill. So this is just showing you the great need of young people to work um, with a strong mentor in in the area of research because they understand that this is going to be a stepping stone to getting into the workforce. So I'll tell you another program that we run. This is now at the graduate level and it synergizes with research centers in the Bay Area. So this program is funded by the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine and it provides students in our master's program an opportunity to learn about a cutting edge field which is um, stem cell biology. So we only accept 10 students in this program each year, and they get the opportunity to work with scientists in our collaborating institutions, which is UC Berkeley, UCSF, um, the Buck Center for Regenerative Medicine and for Aging, um, Children's Hospital, Stanford University. So these students are working with premier researchers um, in the area. They take classes at San Francisco State, and then they spend the majority of their time learning about stem cell and regenerative medicine. Um, we've had 50 students go through this program so far, and they ha every single one has completed it successfully. Some will go on to medical school or graduate school. Some enter the biotech workforce. Some um, become educators. And in fact, one of our talented students is now working in the uh, Center for Math and Science Education, teaching stem cell biology classes at San Francisco State. Um, the last effort I want to talk about is, is, oh, actually, here's another slide that just shows you a little bit the components of the stem cell program, where you have, um, it's a two-year master's program, and I think I just mentioned all the elements. So um, the last thing I wanted to mention is a broader effort in the biology department. 
We have over 2,000 students in our program. And as much as we would like to give each one of these students a tailored opportunity to do research with a faculty member, it, it's beyond our capacity. So another strategy is to improve the way that we teach science in the classroom. So this program is funded by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And the focus here is to provide the latest, greatest teaching advances um, to our faculty and provide them with the time and resource to um, infuse it into their classrooms. And the goal is that regardless of the size of the classroom, whether we're teaching a 200-person classroom or a 20-person classroom, that we're going to br bring um, innovation into the classroom so the students will all experience you know, hands-on, inquiry-based um, um, instructional learning um, opportunities. And so I, th I think I did it in four minutes. <laughs> all right, thank you. <laughs> So we were hopeful that uh, Antwi Akom, uh, he's currently, I believe, with some funders. We are very hopeful he would come in with bags of money. Yes. <laughs> but I've just found out he won't be joining us. So uh, I think instead we'll take a few minutes of questions, if there are any. Yes? I have a question who Robert Noyce is. I wanted to know who Robert Noyce was. Um, I believe this is uh, the person who's uh, made seminal contributions to silicon engineering. Yes? You know? I just have a comment. I wanted to thank you because my kid's math teacher in a public school in San Francisco is a graduate of your program, and she's shaken up math the whole school, and she's a brilliant teacher. And so, oh, wow. thank you very much. Wow, fantastic! Thank you for that comment, um, Jalen. Uh, Robert Noyce founded Intel. I think he invented a transistor, <laughs> which is, turns out to be pretty important. <laughs> President? Do you, do you think the odds are good that once these students move through the process that they'll stay here in San Francisco? Oh, yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> are you talking about the, the teachers and the, the stem cell researchers, et cetera? Um, I can't speak about the researchers, but the, the teachers, I think, actually, this is something we want to work more closely with the district on. I mean, we have a lot of excellent teachers coming out, and we want to make sure that the ones who want to stay here can be hired in some kind of systematic way. And I don't think we're quite aligned right now. Okay. Yes, sir? Where do you determine uh, where the students are placed in terms of the program that you've learned? Do you want to say something about the When you do that, for the, if it's just the, the noise scholars, we've actually identified teachers who have worked with some of the research things. For example, Mia's placed with um, a master teacher at Visitation Valley Middle School who's been a member of the SERP research community and done action research on own. So we're looking to find mentors in these schools who are really well aligned with working in urban schools and doing those kind of things. So the noise is a much smaller group. The overall credential program is slightly different in terms of placing them. Again, we don't just work with San Francisco, we work with other districts in the larger credential program. I have 16 students right now placed in schools in San Francisco Unified in the East Bay and Berkeley, Albany and in the Peninsula Daily City and down a little bit further. Thank you. Um, Five years from now, when you when you look at what you're doing, where would you like to be with this program? What's your goal oh, over time? Oh, the whole panoply that you've... Sorry. Yeah, I, I mean, I think given the demand, I would love to see these programs grow. I mean, the students emerging from any of the three programs I just spoke are much more likely to enter graduate programs, enter biotech companies. Most of the students who enter the biotech company after finishing CERM make more money as entering salary than a starting salary as a faculty <laughs> member at state. <laughs> so they're doing extremely, extremely well. So if we could just broaden it to include just more students, uh, you know, it would be wonderful. Will it just take more money or just more faculty or? Uh, it's, it's a combination of both, right? So it requires more resources because with limited faculty, you can only take on so many students in a research lab. And then with added resources, the science itself is very expensive. So the supplies and things that the students need in order to conduct the research requires funds as well. Just for also for the Robert Noyce program, there is a phase two. So I'd love to see five years that we jump on and get the second set. Because we have the capacity here with the Center for Science and Math for phase two. There's a second piece. When you hear Robert Noyce, you hear the name. There's multiple Robert Noyce portfolio grants. And what I'd also like to see happen is work with um, that we work more with in-service in teachers. There's a Robert Noyce Teacher Fellow Master Teaching Grant to work with 
getting the teachers in the districts, San Francisco Unified, to work with us to become master teachers, support our student teachers, and also support them in their own sense of content pedagogy, particularly with <coughs> new science standards that are coming out right now. So we're looking at multiple things, keeping the pre-service going, then also expanding it to in-service and the kind of things with teachers are in the schools. Thank you. Yes. Yes, I wondered if there was a library element in this because there's a lot of wonderful databases so that students can do research and find out what's been done and if they have ideas that are different than what their mentor has, they can kind of set out on their own. So I wondered what that there was there. I would say <laughs> they have to have access to wonderful databases and resources. And so um, moving towards on, online resources has really expanded some of the uh, materials and journals that are available. The students who are placed at the UC, the range of information they can get at those libraries far exceeds our own. And so a lot of times there's cross-pollination. So the students can bring in resources to our campus through their connections with all the other universities in the area. Do you have a mentor in the library that can help them? Um, well, Pam has been a wonderful mentor. In fact, for the undergraduate program, the summer program, we um, have a, a training session in the library so that they can learn how to use those resources, and, and Pam has, has led that, that effort. So, thank you. <laughs> I don't even know uh, you. Larry, did you want to say something? <laughs> okay. uh, I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Go ahead. So my question is about supply and demand. Uh, have you figured out whether what you're doing is is actually uh, commensurate with what the demand is? Uh, how do you know how to grow? A deep question. Yeah. I mean, I would say first of all, there's a, there's different kinds of demand. So there's demand by the students to be part of the program, <coughs> and so far we're not close to filling the demand for these programs. And then you're probably talking about things like producing teachers. Um, I'm not quite sure what the answer to that is, but I believe right now a number of school districts are in a position of not being able to be as picky as they'd like to about the teachers they hire. And so I think it would be nice if, te if there was so much supply of excellent teachers that districts could really um, hire in a very picky way. Yeah, I'll say one thing, the demand for the teachers, if I look at that piece, is actually in the schools that say me is committed and our noise fellows are committed, high need schools, that literally they get the scholarship is $10,000 a year with a commitment to teach two years in schools. Those schools cannot fill their STEM positions. So that's the case of going in there. They, they, it's actually really difficult. So there's a demand in the schools where most of the need is. All of the candidates that come through San Francisco State right now, if they want to teach science and or math in California, and they're willing to move sometimes, they will be doing so. We're still, we're hitting that point where there is still a demand, especially for highly qualified, thoughtful math and science teachers in STEM. So I, we don't, I don't see a problem with any of those kind of <coughs> program finding positions that one, so from that perspective. This all sounds so wonderful, I hate to bring up something negative, but with the federal sequestration of funds yeah. and you get federal funds, is that eventually going to be a problem and is that something you're looking at? Yeah. Well, I think eventually, but uh, right. well, the NSF grants, I believe, will be fully funded okay, and NIH. Can I, can I say yes. something from the federal level? Um, I'm retired federal um, statistician. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to let you know that STEM, to have our own children be involved, is very critical. Because when, when we look at um, you know, our competition globally, right now, um, from the federal, I'm in the federal statistical system, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, from the National Center for Education Statistics, Health Statistics, the U.S. Census Bureau, we cannot fill the positions. We don't have enough. Of our, because we need to hire U.S. citizens, we don't have enough of our kids, and it's terrible because now what we're doing at NIH at NSF is um, bringing in people from abroad on, on three-year renewable contracts, and to us that's a real shame when we should be hiring our own children. And don't worry about the sequestration. Um, we gotta, we gotta do this. We gotta do it now. And I'm so proud of San Francisco State. I'm an alumni. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think we have time maybe one more question. Yes. So um, I may have misunderstood the presentation, but it seems to me that you know we lose a lot of students early on before they hit high school. We lose their lose them in their interest in pursuing STEM, and so 
Um, well, I think it's really important that we, we train highly qualified and passionate science teachers at the secondary level. I'm, as a former elementary school teacher, I've met too many who, too many of my colleagues who were afraid of math, disinterested in science. Thank you, that's a good point. If we had another 24 minutes, I'd love to talk <laughs> about yeah. some of the elementary programs that we're involved we're with, but we're, we have a, we have a yes. partnership with the district focusing yes. on math and also with science, so yes. I think we are out of time. Thank so you. thank you all. Thank you. Uh, the next panel that I am pleased to introduce is STEM Beyond the Lab, Technology, Community, and Health. This panel will address how active and interactive partnerships with community residents with the medical community in particular, and also through good old fashioned data crunching, help us to understand what works to affect cures and prevent disease. The panel lead is Dr. Cynthia Gomez, who is director of San Francisco State's Health Equity Institute, which focuses on health uh, equities and disparities in our country and particularly in the state of California and the Bay Region. Uh, next to her is uh, Professor Christina Sabi, who's an Associate Professor in Communication Studies in the College of Liberal and Creative Arts. Next to her is Anoshua Chowdhury, an Associate Professor in the Economics Department in the College of Business. And at the far end of the table is Sean Gabell, a senior undergraduate student who is majoring in economics. Cynthia? Good afternoon. President Wong, Mrs. Wong, I hope you're enjoying your week. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so I, uh, you know, m might mention to my neighbor that we're talking STEM today, um, and sometimes they think I'm talking maybe plants, bicycles, or cells. <laughs> um, so I try to explain no, that um, well, that's not what we're talking about. Uh, we are talking uh, about science, technology, engineering and math. But even within the discipline of STEM, if you will, it is often perceived as more of the laboratory, computer science, um, and not the broader agenda of STEM, which is really to create synergy across disciplines um, and really uh, link uh, what we're doing to the broader uh, society. And so this panel is really going to uh, focus on that piece um, and really talk a little bit about applied sciences, if you will, and how we involve our students uh, with projects such as those. So the typical version is, of course, we have our academic, the world of academia. Um, we prepare our students um, to then be sent into the world. And um, we generate new knowledge. We, we really build the skills that we need uh, in, in the global society. But at San Francisco State, as I think you're hearing over and over again, we actually want it to be a two-way situation uh, rather than one unidirectional. Um, and so we bring the world to our students. Um, and really it's making sure that the education that they're getting is in the context of the real world. And that really allows them, by the time they actually graduate, they are really at the top of their fields because they've been involved in the actual application of what they're studying. And so there's something very, very unique about that. And I can tell you that as a high school student, that's what got me excited, was to actually be around people who were helping me understand why what I was learning actually mattered. And so we see a lot of that at San Francisco State. Health Equity Institute is one place where we really try to do that. We um, have been founded as a transdisciplinary institute at the university. We bring together different disciplines of of the university, um, and we're trying to link science to practice uh, to really achieve better health for all. Um, health inequities, you know, have really been described as um, things that really are health differences that are systemic, avoidable, unfair, and unjust. And so the purpose of our institute is really to try to combat those injustices um, and really continue the real spirit of equity and social justice 
with the focus on health specifically. This is a sample of some of the research that our faculty are leading. All of these projects have uh, student teams associated with it. It runs a variety of topic areas. Um, and again, these are really significant works that are contributing to the fields that they're a part of. Um, and really, again, towards the focus of improving the health of our communities. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about one in particular, um, Hope SF Housing Initiative. Some of you may know about this initiative. Um, this is an effort to transform uh, our public housing units that have been really, um, over time, dilapidated, really falling apart, and really reconstruct them and bring in new housing, but not displacing anyone. And what's been great about our association with Hope SF um, is that it's really an opportunity, again, to bring together students, faculty, community for a, for a common good. In this project, which our collaboration, we now call it uh, the Health Equity for Hope SF collaboration, uh, began in 2011. And it involves the actual Hope SF um, Campaign for Hope, the Department of Public Health, the San Francisco um, Department of Public Health, our institute, and the Department of Health Education. Importantly, what we've been able to do in this partnership is have students who are master's in public health students do assessments within public housing units with the residents to try to find out what their priorities are in achieving better health in their particular conditions. The renovations of the housing units are intended to not only be physical uh, renovations, but to include focuses on health improvement, education improvement, and workforce development. We've had the great opportunity to become the health pillar uh, for this uh, movement, if you will, that will take several years. And so last year, uh, the students had a chance to really ask residents about peer leadership. Peer-to-peer -peer health, is it gonna work in a public housing unit to have peers be the educators about health promotion? So they went out and did a series of assessments, created great reports that really started to then inform what's really gonna be happening in terms of programs that can be implemented within these areas. And so we also then collaborated with the residents and wrote a proposal to NIH in hopes that we will gain more support and resources to help them implement what they want in their resident area. So it's really about meeting people where they are, seeing what they wanna do for themselves, and helping it happen. The uh, final piece which is happening th uh, this semester is really focused on mental health, which is a second area that the residents are really, really wanting to improve. And so we're working with a group, again, of experts, a group of students, and together trying to come up with what will be the solutions that can be implemented within these public health settings. So that's just an example of how we're in the real world, doing real work, and our students, again, are walking out really knowing how to do things that they'll be doing in a position, in a job, and they've already been doing them. So it's very, very exciting. Um, finally, I'm just gonna say about the Institute, we also have um, documentaries for social justice and health. Uh, students in cinema and in other health uh, areas get together and uh, develop a documentary in collaboration with a community-based organization. I encourage you to take a look at our website. We have over 30 documentaries at this point. They're available free of charge. Um, they're really meant for communities to use them for dialogue. And again, it's another way in which students across disciplines get together and impact their own communities. So that's an example. I'm gonna now move to Christina to talk about In Touch. One of the nice things about getting beyond the lab, especially with younger people, is sometimes it's just playing around with the science and playing around with the technology that gets people involved. So um, over the past couple of years, I've been working with one of the faculty from the Health Equity Institute on a project that we're calling In Touch, which is getting high school students more involved in using a mobile device to help them with their own health management goals. Um, I probably don't have to tell you about the extreme epidemic of obesity that our country is seeing where every year more and more children are he heavier and heavier. Um, we see a lot of health effects because of it. Um, and so what we looked into was thinking about how do we meet the challenges 
for especially youth that are find themselves in low income status, that are obese or overweight, and that are also dealing with feelings of anxiety and depression, which are often associated with that particular uh, health problem. Um, we discovered that trying to meet their needs through technology was going to be specifically challenging because of uh, their low income status. They often didn't have uh, access to computers, smartphones, technology, things like that. Um, also, uh, youth that feel sick, um, or youth that, fe that are obese or overweight don't feel sick. Um, they don't realize that they have some specific sort of condition or concern, and the hospital or medical model isn't important to them. It's not appropriate. They don't go see a doctor or a nurse. So how do we get them involved? Um, in realizing that we had really a lack of tools to reach out to those patients, um, and also noticing that this was a real communication issue, uh, particularly youth were not talking to healthcare providers. We worked um, on this project to make this what we call, uh, let's try this one. Oh, sorry, my slide is not changing. Well, um, what we were calling for youth by youth, uh, specifically to uh, look into how we could make that work for, for youth. Um, and so we created a youth advisory board, which made up of San Francisco State students and students around the Bay Area, um, looking into different ways that they could use technology to try to um, manage their own weight uh, problems. We brought their recommendations into the field and worked with Mission High School and, and the San Francisco Unified School District to try to get students using applications um, on smartphones to get them to help manage their own weight and notice different uh, things about their daily living. Um, in doing that, we actually found we had a lot of success. We did uh, employ health coaches, which were people that we trained to help those high school students use the technology to become familiar with it, to record things about themselves. Uh, and we were very happy with the results of that particular project, getting involved in the high schools with our, um, with our own people. Um, so over the course of the next couple of years, our plan is to really expand this pilot project, to start training our own San Francisco State students, to get them in there, helping um, our high school students learn a little bit more about social media and technology, and how they can use that to really help themselves in their own health situations. Um, and finding out that those students really learn about a lot of opportunities that they otherwise might not have. Um, and so we've been really happy with that. I am unsure how to get the slide to um, Anashua's. Uh, let's see. Even the escape button wasn't working for me, so. So it's uh, closing. Thank you, Christina. <laughs> Thank <Sorry>. you. <laughs> And many times I get this question, what the heck is health ec ec economics? And um, I, I believe that um, uh, we can go beyond the lab and um, make STEM education, uh, more strengthen STEM education by having, peop having these students use their scientific approach to um, look at the world around them and analyze policy and be able to evaluate uh, the real world and think outside the box and become better policy makers, better innovators, um, as well as um, uh, be um, more informed um, advocates and activists. Um, so what do we do in health economics and what do we do in the social sciences and um, business education? Um, I was going to focus on two main things um, to look at um, jobs and something that everybody's talking about. You may have seen the latest Time magazine that uh, devoted the entire issue on cost of healthcare. Okay. Thank you, Sean. I wanted to point you to this slide. Um, uh, during the period of 2007-2009, which we now call the Great Recession, we looked at the, we were looking at the labor market, uh, entire manufacturing sector was losing jobs, and what, which were the sectors that were gaining jobs? You'll see uh, the, uh, the ones in blue, the, these were mostly healthcare and education. 
And uh, more than 50% of sectors that were gaining jobs were all in healthcare, and I've listed these. So this is where our um, uh, you know, future uh, workforce is get going to get into. Um, the second thing that I wanted to point out is in the United States, my little blurb didn't come up, but you, you all, all of you may have, or if you haven't, uh, m pick up the Time magazine from last week. It, it's really uh, an interesting read that talks about uh, what's going on with cost uh, in, in uh, healthcare in the United States. And I want to point you to these two graphs. The one on the left uh, shows that uh, health spending as a share of GDP has been steadily increasing in the United States. Um, and how do we compare with the rest of the con uh, other countries that spend the most? Um, if you look on the right, U.S. is way up there, and uh, everyone else is, you know, trailing far behind. With um, o OECD is the average right here. This is the average of all the Western countries, um, and um, U.S. seems to be spending the most. Uh, why is this so? What are we spending on? Well, we pay more than everyone else on everything that we, uh, that we get in the healthcare sector. Does that mean we provide more care? Well, evidence is mixed uh, on that. Um, we definitely get more MRI scans, more CT scans, uh, more knee replacements, more angioplasties. But we have less physicians, we have less hospital beds, we have lower hospital stays compared to everyone in these other Western countries. Um, so how does this impact our students? Um, well, there's, there's a, the negative side as well as opportunity. Um, I'm going to quickly go through the negative side, but I also talk about the opportunity for students in this sector. So healthcare is getting less affordable. It's creating inequities. <laughs> It's creating higher dropout rates. It's creating um, less disposable income for students who go on and ha get, get jobs. More and more uh, proportion of their income is getting spent on healthcare. But this also means opportunities. If we can think outside the box and innovate to reduce cost of healthcare, um, this is where our STEM education is going to um, get us more bang for our buck. Um, I'm going to quickly talk about what is health economics and how would this um, help students. Um, these are some of the things that we do in health economics. We try to understand the U.S. healthcare system and compare it to other um, uh, healthcare delivery systems around the world, and more more so, we evaluate. Um, health outcomes, evaluate impacts of policies and programs, and, and help people to understand the world around them and analyze it better. Um, what I'm going to do next year is have my e economic students not do a data project, uh, just being in the classroom, but actually I'm going to uh, get them out in the community, partner with community um, agencies, and have them do the data analysis with the community agency um, to get them to get the um, real world experience as well as feel the ownership that they're making a difference in the community. At, at the same time, learning um, a, a good real world application. Um, I'm going to now introduce Sean Gavel, my student in health economics. Um, and as of this weekend, he this is March, and he's going to graduate in May. And he's already got placed with Deutsche Bank, and he will be placed in Manila. Hi. Uh, okay. Um, so, hello. My name is uh, Sean Gabel, and um, I'm, of course, econ major. And today I'll be presenting to you health and the student. The reason why health is so important, especially for STEM, is because that when we, when you, we're the product of whatever all you professors teach us. But however, if we're, let's say, obese or have some type of health, Im health imposed health defect, then that knowledge we have will end up burning out. 
within 30 years. And what's the point of teaching when the knowledge isn't fully utilized? So as, uh, as an example, here is me. Uh, <laughs> um, as you can see, uh, before economics, um, you can say I was undeclared. Um, I had a major, but it was really undeclared. Um, and on the right side, it was pre-economics, I was 250 pounds. And on the left side, uh, it was actually uh, exactly a year uh, later, was I was 170 pounds. And yeah, this didn't mean to become a Subway Jared uh, talk. <laughs> Uh, but um, what the, th the point is that, in general, um, all of us are connected to each other. Everyone here is connected, and any choices we make actually affect each other. Oh. Um, so, and on top of that, as I stated before, there's, there's some type of obesity crisis. I, actually, 24 million uh, Americans now have diabetes and that will come at a great cost later in our nation. So what, what caused this was actually um, our friend, the United States government back in the 1930s, which created subsidies for the uh, for farmers for corn and um, soybeans, which later down the line actually produced hydrogenated fats and high fructose corn syrup and which can be found in all of our food products. So the thing about hydrogen, uh, high fructose corn syrup is that when we eat it, we don't stop eating. There, it doesn't release a chemical that actually tells us, hey, you've eaten too much, you're gonna get sick later. Um, so what happens coupled along with, um, with our what we do during our leisure time, and believe it or not, we actually have four extra hours of leisure time compared to 1970. So, as uh, economist theory, I, it's hard to believe, but yeah. <laughs> um, as, so, as an economist, the, the theory is that because it tastes better, because it's cheaper, and because we do less with our time, as students, we become more sickly, we become less likely to go to class because you know, we're sick or too lazy to get out of bed. <laughs> and so that it, it actually ends up really being a det uh, detriment to the student body as a whole. <laughs> but um, I would like to propose something to you, President Wong, uh, in order to um, help students and all these students and actually even everyone here um, uh, uh, we students are a product of what you guys teach us what everything you do we actually internalize and keep on doing that throughout our school time so down the line I would really like to see um, SF State become a hydrogenated free and uh, high corn fructose corn syrup free uh, campus so that uh, the health of the student body as a whole will increase. Also, also, I would really like that everyone here would um, talk to their students and really say that, you know, um, yes, study hard. Do what you got to do to really understand and internalize that knowledge. But make sure you take care of yourself first because last week I was actually hospitalized and now I'm like, everything was like pushed back and I'm still trying to play catch up. So, and everyone knows that when you're sick, you can't produce as much. And that is my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I will take a couple of questions. Any questions? Yes. There was an interesting study done about 15 years ago about why students don't complete their doctoral degrees. And a surprisingly high percentage of the reasons was poor health. And that really surprised me. Yes, President. 
I broke in the challenge because um, we are, in fact, implementing a, a review of food sources to on the campus. So if you, your first wish is, is on its way to be granted. The second one is that I did sponsor a 5K run yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you had a beautiful day for it. I was looking around the room to see how many people were there. <laughs> and I won't say. <laughs> I wish I did, in fact, run it. <laughs> Yes. I was curious on the health issues, both the, your equity project, health equity project, um, in terms of the health services in San Francisco Unified School District, do you have a link with the school nurses and the other um, health practitioners in the district and the program that you're... We work very closely with the um, school nurse at Mission High School, um, and who was very interested in referring us toward other school nurses who heard about the project. And, um, so, yes, I, I don't think you can do a project like that without having a, a link, for sure. Absolutely. Many of our, our school-based projects, uh, we depend on, on <coughs> the district uh, nurses and others that are working closely with us. And they just got the contract for Revolution Foods. <laughs> right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Uh, just a quick thing. It's a question for you, because uh, having just left Michigan, Detroit Public Schools, conducted a very large study of uh, nutrition, et cetera, and actually found out that one of the problems is that uh, the African-American families that comprise the majority of Detroit public schools mm -hmm. had the least access to stores that mm -hmm. even yeah. sold mm -hmm. uh, healthy, you know, healthy right. We We have a very similar problem in, in San Francisco. That's, that was my question. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we, we uh, part of the health coach's job, in addition to sort of helping the students track their own uh, sort of observations of daily living, excuse me, observations of daily living and helping them figure out what was going on in their life was to help them identify those issues and try to come up with different ways that they might get around those issues for now because we can't solve the systemic problem at this point, although I, I believe there are many other people kind of focusing on that. But um, our health coaches, along with different tracking, we're, we're able to help those students try to figure out, you know, are there different places in the city that they can exercise? Are there different methods for them to obtain healthy, uh, healthy food? Revolution Foods, I imagine, this was before Revolution Foods, but I think that will really make a big difference because that's, a, that's an important contract, too. Well, the whole concept they must be doing something to get yeah. grocery mm -hmm. stores and stuff like that. Uh, actually, working very hard with food security issues, um, and, and also the exercise issues. Uh, you know, Sunday Streets is something San Francisco State mm -hmm. is very involved in, um, bringing exercises into communities. So, um, we're trying to make it happen. Yeah. yeah. One last question? Well, I was for more of a comment. Please. I was wondering if working with the students at San Francisco State, if you're also encouraging them to take advantage of the amazing rec um, health classes. I mean, there's so many yoga classes and wonderful classes that are available to students that a lot of students don't seem to know about, and it's available for faculty and staff, and a lot of people don't know. And so in terms of balance, I think that's really important to let people know about, and also about the arts events and the arts facilities that we have on campus, because I would like to say, see this is referred to as STEAM. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Arts, you know, our school superintendent is a very big proponent of <coughs> arts into this whole equation, and I just think on campus we have so many resources Absolutely, and again, that, the documentary course is a great example of that. Um, but our hope is that we become models for ourselves, right? We start with our own house, try to get um, our own health, and uh, more more 5K runs, maybe. Uh, can I just Thank make you a, very much. a quick comment about the classes offered? Um, I actually took that yoga class you were talking about, and I had to um, crash it, too, and I was 20th in line, and just by randomness I, I got picked to actually go into the class and I I convinced many of my friends to take the those health classes the, the workout classes and what's interesting even this semester wh which is a lot better than when I when I was in sophomore year they still had to crash those same classes there's a huge demand for it well th that's my personal experience but they're not able to get in and uh, two of them Okay. So I think that there's like a missing link the in the communication the there about they're not classes that you sign up for credit, they're classes that you take outside oh, okay. in addition to.
now I get to. Great. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Uh, our final panel this afternoon uh, will also stimulate considerable discussion, I know. This panel is called Education Equity, Science for the Social Good and Preparing the Next Generation of STEM Leaders, the Metro Academies Initiative. Metro Academies, for those of you who ha are not familiar with it, is a partnership between the Departments of Health Education at San Francisco State University and City College of San Francisco. It's a two-year program that focuses on retaining and graduating underrepresented, low-income, and first-generation college students. Uh, you'll recognize those adjectives as correlated with some of the other issues we have been discussing, particularly on the last panel. The program uses numerous high-impact practices supported by research to benefit student learning, and these include learning communities, tutoring, extra academic counseling, and electronic portfolios to exhibit students' new skills. Students receive one-on-one -on -one support from faculty and construct individual education paths with an academic counselor. The lead for this panel is Dr. Mary Beth Love, who is the co-principal investigator of the Metro Academies Initiative, and she's also chair and professor of health education in the College of Health and Social Sciences at San Francisco State. Uh, to her right is Dr. Savita Malik, the Director of Curriculum and Faculty Development for the Metro Academies in the College of Health and Social Sciences. Uh, immediately next to her is Marilyn Thomas, the STEM coordinator for the Metro Academy of Health and a San Francisco State graduate student working on a master's degree in public health. And at the far end of the table is Arai Buendia, a senior undergraduate student who is majoring in health education. Welcome, Mary Beth and the panel. Thank, Thank you. you. President Wong and Mrs. Wong, I really want to extend a warm welcome to you to not only a wonderful university, but a wonderful university in a wonderful city. Um, and uh, w I, I'm entering my 26th year at San Francisco State, and I'm um, thrilled and delighted at the new energy you're bringing to campus, and um, we're really happy to have you. So welcome, I hope this week is very rewarding for you. Um, our goal today is to talk to you about the Metro Academy Initiative, and to begin, we are going to present you with a, an overview of the Metro Academy, which is a uh, partnership between San Francisco State and City College, and it is a redesign of the first two years of higher education, both at the City College and at uh, San Francisco State. I'm very proud of the work we're doing because I think it's really important. Most of the students in those two institutions, in those two tiers of education, are students who uh, we need. <laughs> we need. We need as a country, we need as a democracy, and uh, they deserve the very best from us as far as public higher education. And so I'm, 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 I'm very proud of the work that's going on both at City College and at San Francisco State in general, uh, but particularly in the work that mostly <coughs> my colleagues help make happen. There are three academies right now uh, which house about 500 students. We do have one in the broad area of health, so they're broad career themed. Uh, the other one is in uh, early childhood development and the third is in science, technology, engineering, and math in STEM, which is why we were invited here today. We're now in our fourth year, so uh, we do have seniors who are graduating this year, which is quite unusual. It usually takes six years. We're hoping to cut down on that time uh, through this intervention. Uh, and also, we want to share with you our plans for the next five years, and we were lucky enough to uh, be awarded a grant that are go is going to help us to do that. 
But to begin with, I want to talk first about why in this election and the last, I wanted the byline to be, it's education stupid. Um, because we have a problem. <laughs> in, if you look at this graph, you can see when comparing the 34 countries in the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, that is those countries who are considered high income or developed countries, the U.S. ranks number four, not bad, four, with 41% of our citizens between the ages of 24 and 64 who have at least a two-year degree. Oh, now this is going to upset me. How come this isn't going, Mark? Uh, Eric. Where's Eric? I have my computer. <laughs> you want to hook mine up? Okay, Good. there, all right. Good. Now, here's the next one. However, when you look at the world standing, our world standing, it's weaker for younger students, those who are the next generation of leaders in the United States, who we all know face a more competitive and more complicated world. When ranked against fellow OE, CD countries, we fall to 15th in the percentage of young adults who have a post-secondary education, with Korea, Ireland, Norway, New Zealand, England, Australia, Denmark, Luxembourg, friends, France, Israel, Belgium, and Sweden <coughs> outstripping us. Now watch this. When we take another view, of data, which is very compelling and of great concern, we are near the bottom of intergenerational progress. The difference between adults, you and me, over 55, <laughs> who have a post-secondary education when public education was supported in the way that it should be, and the percentage of young people between the ages of 25 and 34 who are buried in debt to get a higher education, we see that we have fallen to nearly the bottom of this listing. So what this means, this is a product of, of American exceptionalism, our belief that we're on top just because. <laughs> we're on top because we invested in our citizens and we had the first public education well funded in the world. What this is telling us is everybody else is funding while we are disinvesting. Big problem. It is why it's so important. It's why having you as members of our community here to support us. San Francisco State, the CSU, the community college, our students get stellar education and they graduate with less debt. But because of where we are now, we really need a lot of help from our communities to make this happen. So it is not only an economic issue, it is important for our democracy. It's important to have engaged, well-educated citizens to make decisions about how we spend our resources and about the equitable distribution of our resources. So I'm going to turn the podium over now to Marilyn Thomas, who's running our STEM program and is a product of the Science Cozy College at San Francisco State. And she's going to talk to you about the economic argument as well. Thank you, Mary Beth. Now you guys know why she's one of my sheroes. <laughs> I've got some heroes, but she's one of my sheroes. Um, OK, thank you. So it, it is an economic issue, right? So um, a report issued by the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology concluded that if the United States is to maintain our historic preeminence in the STEM field and at the same time gain the social, economic, and national security benefits that come with that preeminence, then we're going to have to produce about a million STEM workers in the next decade. So in addition to that, Georgetown University Center of Education, or on education and the workforce, predicts that 92% of STEM workers will need post-secondary education by 2018. So in addition to that, 
65% of STEM job openings will require at least a bachelor's degree, at least a bachelor's. And we're not really addressing the 35% of um, students that or jobs that will require an associate degree or certification of some kind. So it is an economic issue. And in addition to that, it's a retention and graduation issue. So 60% of students who enter college with the goal of majoring or graduating with a science degree end up graduating with a non-STEM degree. And what's even more significant is that women and minorities are the most underrepresented in the fields of science, in the STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. So we have an idea of what's causing this trend. So as mentioned before by uh, Eric Sue and Mr. Blakeman, the first two years are a really leaky pipeline at university. Um, we lose about 40% of our first time freshmen in that first two years. In fact, we did, um, we did a, we, we studied all of the black and Latino students that entered San Francisco State declaring a science major and followed them until 2011. Only one, one student graduated with a, a degree in STEM. So, there's, you know, there's a lot of contributing factors for that. One is the lack of preparedness. So we're finding that remediation is an issue for our students. About 57% of the students that enter San Francisco State require remediation for math and science. And remediation just means it's not college level. They're not ready for college level math and science. So they have to take these remedial courses before they can take the college level courses. And those courses don't offer college credit. So that's impactful. In addition to that, Students feel like they are on a solo journey within those first two years. So we know that general education is very, very important for well-rounded scientists and professionals in all fields. Um, however, lower division courses are multidisciplinary and they're not interconnected. So you're not sharing those classes with students that share the same interests and majors as you. So that leaves students feeling disconnected from each other and from the university. And we know that community, a sense of community, is, you know, especially on campus, it really does increase student engagement and retention. So um, another issue that impacts um, retention is insufficient academic support. So as mentioned, you know, the state of California um, is digressing, disinvesting. And one of the things is the academic support. So we are 49th in counselor to student ratio. The state of California is. And at San Francisco State, we serve a, a, a little over 26, 20, almost 26,000 undergraduate students. And our advisor to student ratio is 1 to 2,000. So that's significant. And finally, our students do tend to spend a more limited time on campus. You know, San Francisco State is a commuter school. Our students live very complicated lives, and we know that, right? They're, um, you know, their parents, they're full-time workers, they have families, and sometimes they come to school, and they, as soon as their class is out, they're gone to go take care of their personal business. So that can also leave students feeling very, you know, a weaker sense of community and social support on their campus. So. Our mission at the Metro Academies, Academies initi Initiative is listed here, but we understand that learning really happens when students are engaged with the material. So here is our mission. Our mission is to increase equity in college completion through engaging, supportive, rigorous, and socially relevant education. So I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Savi Malik, and she's going to give you a little bit of an overview about our program. Thanks, Marilyn. Um, so our program is a school within a school, basically. We're trying to make San Francisco State just a little bit smaller for our students. 
We serve 140 students every year in the program, and it's a long-duration learning community. Many of you in here may know the learning community literature. You make the school a little bit smaller, you give students linked courses, you give them a little bit more support, they're going to do better in their classes overall, even the classes that are not the learning community classes. So <coughs> the sequence, this sequence that's up here exists both at City College and at SF State. And you'll see that there's courses that they're taking simultaneously over the course of two years. They take a critical thinking course their first semester that's linked with a first year experience class. And that class gets them acclimated to the university, tells them all the am amazing services that we have at San Francisco State, gets them acclimated, gets them around. And that's linked to a critical thinking class that students have to take anyway. One really important piece of this, every class that they take rings up for graduation and or transfer if you're at this at community college. So everything they take is useful, it's meaningful, it moves them towards their bachelor's degree. The curriculum is really structured and sequenced. So students, in, when they first come in, we have an expectation of how they're going to write when they first come into our program. By semester four, we have a different expectation. We expect that after four semesters of doing this work, you're going to be writing at a different level than when you came in. And that's across the board in both of the learning community classes. Same thing with critical thinking. We think you're going to be a different kind of critical thinker two years in than you would be when you first start our program. You can see the four skills that are across the top. Those are individual courses that are requirements for graduation and transfer. But they're also really critical skills in the workforce today. We need students that are able to critically think and solve problems on the job. We need them to be able to communicate effectively in teams and in, in the public. We need them to be able to write well, and we need them to have a basic quantitative math literacy before moving forward. We also, as Mary Beth mentioned, integrate our support services into our classrooms, which is a little different. It, me it meets the need that Marilyn was suggesting about commuter students. We're, if we're not addressing them in the classroom, we're losing them. So we have academic counselors that come in that do education plans with each of our students. We have a financial aid counselor that comes in and makes a personal contact with our student that says, hey, you have a problem with financial aid? Come talk to me. Here's my name. Here's my contact information. Our students are much more likely to go and receive services once they've met her. Um, and as, as Mary Beth mentioned, we also have e-portfolios as a really integral part of what we do. With all the focus on student learning outcomes, both with the Common Core in K-12 and now in higher education, we really need to know, are we doing what we say we're doing? Are we assess We need to assess our students, but we want to assess them holistically, not just through test scores, not just through GPA. Are they really gaining the learning outcomes that we really think that they're getting in our classrooms? One other piece of this program that's really important, and it's especially important to me, I just finished my dissertation, um, on the faculty learning community in the Metro Academies. It's a piece of this that if we're, we're, we're in a learning community with students, we have to also address the faculty development component of what we're doing. Faculty have to be trained to teach better. Why? Because they aren't. We're content experts. We get doctoral degrees in our content. We don't necessarily get training on how to teach when we enter higher education. And so having this learning community of faculty, they come together, they work on teaching practices. There's a deep analysis on active learning. How do you interact with your classes? Engage teaching strategies. Um, a lot of what Eric was mentioning that Kimberly Tanner does, we're doing with higher education faculty across the board in our seven disciplines as well. So you're seeing kind of a, an interaction with faculty, both at the community college and at the four year, and that's unusual. They're having conversations across institutions as well. How do we make our teaching practice better? You're teaching common at the community college. I'm teaching it at four year. What are you doing? What am I doing? How do we make that work better for, for our students? And ultimately, it benefits our students and leads to greater student success. I'm going to turn it back over to Marilyn for a minute. She's going to talk to you a little bit about how we engage our students in the classrooms. Thank you, Savi. It's me again. Um, okay, so um, a really important component of what we do is we strengthen classroom engagement Did we put that? Yes. Um, through interactive learning with relevant material. Uh, it, the curriculum's engaging because it's relevant to, it meets the students where they are. Um, so each course is infused with real world content. Uh, for example, students learn to make graphs by using public, in this real, public health databases about things going on within their own neighborhoods, their own communities. And then they can write a letter to the editor about it, you know, that kind of thing. And in Metro STEM, what we do is we infuse the material with, with rele you know, topics that are really relevant for science majors. You know, an example of that would be 
uh, reading or, or researching rather uh, individuals or communities um, or organizations that are um, you know, leading the current development in scientific innovation, but in their specific field of interest. So um, it's really relevant and they're really engaged in it. And again, you know, I was mentioning before some of the challenges that students face with the multidisciplinary nature of the lower division courses. And our students can work together to support each other through um, that first two years. So it's, 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 it's very impactful. Um, and again, you know, we believe that our program, of course, you know, would benefit anyone at university, but our program targets the students that we are most likely to lose. And those are our low-income students, our students who are the first generation in their family to attend college, and of course, uh, underrepresented minorities. And so we're really fortunate today to have with us one of our students. Um, this is a Metro Academy student who will be graduating this year. And she would like to share her experience with all of you. So it's my pleasure to introduce Arai. Thank you, thank you. So my name is Arai, and I am a fourth year health education graduating senior. Um, I'm so happy that I made it within four years. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, so I also want to share a little bit about my experiences in the Metro Health program because, um, well, I am a first generation woman in my family to go to college. I am Latino. And what was the other one? <laughs> <laughs> I am a minority. <laughs> so, <laughs> so as um, the statistics were clearly against me, but um, I managed to almost complete my degree. And that's partly due to the experiences that I had within Metro. So we, the small cohort program, really engaged us as a students to form relationship, relationships with each other and really form support groups and go to each other and be there for each other. It's, even though I was, I commuted all my four years from Berkeley to SF State, um, I managed to know what was going on on campus, where the financial aid office was, where the counseling services was, even more than the students that actually lived near campus which is, or on campus, so I, I always thought that it was just a coincidence, but no, it wasn't. It was because of Metro. Like, um, Metro really helped me within even my first semester get to know my teachers, like have the confidence and support to go to them, uh, ask them questions during office hours or email or even during lecture. Um, I think one of my most memorable experiences uh, with ask, like asking support uh, from um, teachers was in my biology class with Dr. Tanner. <laughs> I actually asked her. Uh, she was uh, going through the photosynthesis and Calvin cycle lecture and I raised my hand and I was like, um, can plants get diabetes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she was like, I don't think she expected that question. <laughs> and she kindly replied, um, you should email me and remind me about this question. And I did, and she said, uh, she sent me this really complex article uh, about why plants don't get diabetes, and <laughs> just in case you don't know, <laughs> it's because they, um, they process sugars a little bit differently than we do. <laughs> so, <laughs> which was, I, I was very thankful because I clearly didn't know that. And so, but you know, having the confidence to ask her in the middle of lecture when many of my peers sitting next to me didn't, they have questions, but they never had the courage to ask them. I think that was one of the other things that I uh, got from Metro, having the confidence to really do so and going, and I go to my teachers and critically think about all these concepts. Like, okay, she's talking about sugars, but what does it really mean in like a greater, broader aspect? And so within that, like, uh, I managed to build different relationships, not just with my biology teachers and my science teachers, but also with other disciplines like uh, health, hospital, hospitality and management. Now I'm a, I'm a TA for one of the teachers this semester as I'm graduating. And also like building close 
relationships with my major teachers and faculty. So that really like Metro really emphasized that that there is um there really isn't there shouldn't be like a, a very big bridge between teachers and faculty, but rather like push us to really talk to faculty and and like get them to talk to us about other questions that we might have. And so, but another focus from Metro was the focus on social justice and like critical thinking, like not just having a class in the sciences or in health education as my major, but really like answering the questions, how can I contribute to better, um, how can I contribute to, to, in order, to society in order, in order to change health, health disparities as a person of color graduating? You know, those are really big questions that no grade can provide or give you. So, and really thinking about concepts, like those type of concepts, <laughs> you know? So I really understood um, why that was important, um, why it was important to take the Metro cohort as part of my general education. Because when I was taking the classes, not just from Metro, but like the other required G classes, um, I had no idea why I had to take them. <laughs> I was like, and then later on I understood, oh, I had to take them because it was like time, time management skills, like studying skills and having the confidence to talk to other teachers. And that's, that's really like the main part of the Metro program, really getting students like me to succeed in college. And I think I'm very, no, I'm, I don't think I know, <laughs> I'm very indebted uh, to the Metro Health Program for a really stimulating college experience. I don't think I would have um, gone through my whole college experience without their help and support. And even now, I'm still getting support from them. And so, and with that, like, I cannot say that I know all the answers, um, for like, like that I know the, all the answers. I, on the contrary, I'm left with more answers. But I think I have a whole lifetime to <laughs> answer them. And um, I want to congratulate the, uh, Dr. Juan and welcome him to the SFSU community. It's a very diverse community. And um, I think you'll have fun with us. <laughs> <laughs> and I will turn it on to Savvy um, for more exciting data in Metro. <laughs> So we're, we're getting ready to get the hook. So I'm just going to uh, kind of blow through a little bit of this. If you have more questions about our data, there's actually a, a sheet in your packet that you can look at that's got a, a little bit more of that information. So we're serving our target population. Um, these next two slides, again, I'm just going to move through them quickly. We are serving who we say we are. Um, it's in your packet. Um, we are also, our students are doing well. They're persisting and we're retaining them and hopefully we'll have some data actually at the end of the semester on how quickly we're graduating them as well um, out of San Francisco State since this is our first cohort, RIE is part of the first cohort of four-year grads. Quick mention of City College, we're doing similar, similarly well at City College. Um, we are transferring students at a higher rate than the institution as a whole. Um, and again, I'll, we're, we're more cost efficient. And again, I can, we, I can answer some questions for you a little bit more about this at the end. I'm going to turn it back to Mary Beth for the last final words. Um, you know, why Metro works, we said these things. It's, it, it's really nationally known. This is self-evident. Um, I will say that uh, we, the cost study we did with Jane Wellman, who is one of Obama's major consultants on college cost, and uh, our, and she presented with us when we were in Washington, uh, the marginal additional cost for Metro Academy per student is $660. Um, that is like minuscule uh, compared to what we can save both the state and the students moving them through uh, more quickly. We are um, privileged and so grateful that we have this Strengthening Institutions Program Grant. It's a Title uh, III grant, which will allow us to offer the Metro Academy model to all low-income students, or at 25% of the low-income students. And we need you, and you, and all the leaders at San Francisco State uh, we are putting together a toolkit because our intention is to disseminate so that other um, places can easily do what we do uh, more uh, without the startup. And I will say, really, I think San Francisco State and City College, uh, California uh, um, educates one in eight, eight uh, college students in the country. 
We have 25% of all the community college students in San Francisco, in, in, the, in the country that are in community colleges are in community colleges in California, and 75% of the young people in this state are Latino or Latina. So if we don't get better at doing what we need to do for the students that we're serving, our, again, our democracy and our economy is at risk. So thank you very much for your attention. And um, Steph, do we have a time for a question or two? We don't. OK. So thank you very much. And uh, you have information. Well, a big thank you to all of our panelists uh, for their great presentations today. Please join me in thanking them. And I'd like to open up the floor to additional questions or comments. So I'd ask all the panelists to come up here. And we'll take a few minutes uh, for that. Robert? Robert? Right. Um, well, first, I'm going to say that uh, there's reaching the status with our numbers and then receiving the status from the federal government, which is a slightly different uh, designation. And the data usually lags at least a year, if not a, a more, in my understanding of that. But I would defer to my colleague, uh, Jalon Turkan, uh, who has really looked into this extensively because those grants come through that office. And so, Jaylon? Uh, I'm happy to address that. Uh, we're very, very thrilled to have gotten uh, for the Metro Academies this uh, Strengthening Institutions Program funding through Title III. We did get Title III and V designation last year from the federal government that made us eligible for Title III and V funding. And one of the results of that was that Mary Beth uh, jumped into the pool and was able to get a SIP grant. Uh, during the period of the SIP grant, we're unable to apply for funding, Correct. for Title V funding. But uh, we should start preparing right now because we've gotten very close, if not we're over the goal of achieving HSI enrollments. And it's right now that we need to start thinking about preparing proposals to the Department of Education so we can get the HSI funding. I, w I would mention also that uh, with the SIP grant, we receive certain benefits for uh, work-study students in that we don't have to pay our part for that. So it benefits the entire campus um, on that. Other questions? Yes, maybe. Robert, I just wanted to mention, there's actually a, a, a task force on campus comprised of faculty and staff <coughs> that have been looking at the HSI for over two years. So Linda is a member of that. Yes, yeah, correct. So we're setting infrastructure for that. So we'll be addressing that. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. My question is regarding especially the Metro Academy. That's a wonderful, wonderful program. How about the use of technology, especially in addressing the issue of isolation for the lower division courses, and the use of social media, specifically targeted social media, so the students could create these classes, and also mentorship, mentorship of the faculty, of these students, through FaceTime and use of technology. This way we'd be addressing the issue of digital divide. I mean, just my own experience when email came, I got a whole lot of new set of students who wouldn't talk in class, but would talk to me through email. Not that there's text. I communicate with all my students through text, and I get text from everybody. Uh, so if you could address that. Yeah, so I'll address that just a little bit about Metro. Um, Arayu, actually, I'm glad that she's here because she's grinning at me because she actually came into my office last week and said, you need to do more. You need to do more as Metro with social media. Well, how come you're not doing this? We have a Facebook group. We have a Twitter account that, we, that we're using for the program. Um, as far as getting faculty to, to work with the, the technology, um, we're, it's a little bit of a slower process. <laughs> they, they need a metro program. <laughs> it's a little bit of a slower process. Although they're not, they're not opposed to it, it's just they're, it's not part of everyday life for a lot of our faculty. And so we're, we're working with um, faculty around e-portfolios to start because we really want them to use the uh, academic technology. And then we'll work on the next piece of it going forward. But thank you for that. It is, it is part of our next thing. Juanita? 
I just have a comment and a question, and the comment is, you guys are wonderful, and you know, we're coming full circle. For the, the ones of you who are younger, remember that we used to take the California Achievement Test. We were the gold standard of the world when I went to San Francisco State in 1968. Don't forget that. So it's coming full circle. I'm also a demographer, and um, yes, <laughs> demography you know, is the future. Uh, my question is, the next time you do this, I suggest, is, is, have you thought about maybe a, the second, I mean, or the last panel, which is what we're doing now for those of us women and minorities who are the first cohort in the late 60s and 70s to go into STEM, what we're seeing now, and there's going to be a conference with, with the Institute for Women's Policy Research and the National Science Foundation on the fact that you're talking about losing freshmen, I can't hire people to be managers. The women drop out, the minorities drop out. We get them all the way up, we get them through tenure, and then they don't want to be in management and leadership. So my question is, can you guys deal with that now? Because five years is going to go quickly. Five years is going to go quickly. You're right. That is a huge issue, and there are some programs dealing with that, not so much at San Francisco State, but more on the national level because it's a huge gap, as uh, those of us who are old and gray are looking towards stepping out. Uh, the, the, the succession planning is huge. Yes? One of the least represented groups in STEM courses has always been students with significant disabilities within every single um, minority. Mm -hmm. and the strongest program in the country for bringing, integrating students with disabilities into the sciences is AAAS, with working with NASA, with Intel, with other um, strong employers. Um, they brought scores of students into lifelong careers in the heavy sciences. It's particularly um, a problem in the laboratory-based sciences and the engineering um, we have a long established program within the engineering department to bring in students for at least an introduction to, to tools, to hand, hand work with all kinds of disabilities. We probably have more disabled students than the rest of the STEM courses put together, I don't know. But in any case, how can we help you from our, um, from our school um, to integrate more students with disabilities from every minority into these one comment I would make from the institutional perspective is uh, we just hired a new director of the Longmore Institute for Disability Studies, uh, Kathleen Kudlick uh, from UC Davis, because we did want to continue Paul Longmore's significant work in that area. And she is particularly committed to making that program more interdisciplinary and working with all of the colleges. In the past, it had been more restricted to the humanities and social sciences with Paul's location in the Department of History. But she has reached out significantly, including to the sciences. And I think as she's on campus longer, we'll be forging more of those connections. And so that will be important. That's one aspect of the question you're asking. But I don't know if some of the panelists would care to comment further on that. I would also mention the NSF program. When I was a program officer at NSF, my office was next to the Disability Studies uh, Program Director. So NSF has a significant program also uh, for supporting uh, scientists with disabilities, and particularly during their undergraduate and graduate training, as well as principal investigators. Anybody want to comment? Or she went, there was, okay, yes. Please. So I, I wanted to make a comment. My name is Terry Burgess, and I'm the executive director of the San Francisco School Alliance. And I wanted to thank Dr. Wong and Elizabeth for helping to open the door to invite us and to invite some people from the school district here. I want to introduce everybody to Dr. Luis Valentino. Could you just stand up please for a second? <laughs> Luis is the new chief academic officer at the San Francisco Unified School District, and he is in the district of launching a STEM initiative, which is why all of us who are trying to make this happen really wanted to come today. And I want to thank Eric, because Eric constantly reaches out to try to deal with those ladies and see many of the other people. But I'm excited about the possibilities of us all working together, um, because as you said to me back when the first time I met you, you said me, percent of, the, of the, the teachers that go into the district come from San Francisco State, and at least half of the students come back as students as they graduate. So we're linked together, and we would love to be part of your whole effort. So thank you. 
Well, thank you very much for your comments. Perhaps that is a, a good note on which to close the program. Uh, and I'd really like to thank all of you for attending and participating in today's STEM symposium. We appreciate this opportunity to share with you some of the exciting work that's going on at San Francisco State. I could say that when Jaylon Turkan and I talked about uh, who would participate in this, and we did try to have at least one person from each college who was invited to participate, uh, and you can see that it's across uh, all of the colleges at San Francisco State. We had many selections. There were many more faculty whom we could have tapped because there's a tremendous amount of work in this area going on. So please look at this as the beginning of a conversation and as the tip of the iceberg, in fact, of what San Francisco State is doing in this area to reach out. And we also are so grateful to our community partners. But again, you folks, while the critical mass and the important significant partners, we do have partnerships with other folks in the community too. So in a sense, that's just the tip of the iceberg as we know that you do too. Uh, we hope that all of you are able to join us for other investiture activities this week. And again, uh, to President and Mrs. Wong, welcome and congratulations. We're very happy that you're at San Francisco State. Thank you.